I want to welcome you to our, our event with Beruz Bushani and with our amazing panel that I'm about to introduce, where we're talking about the need for urgent action to evacuate the remaining 59 refugees that are being held in Papua New Guinea. We have got an amazing panel that I'm about to introduce, but again, I just want to acknowledge that we are gathered in the land of the Wurundjeri and the Bulong people of the Kulin Nation to pay our respects to elders both past and present and to keep standing in solidarity for voice, treaty, and truth with First Nations people. Welcome to our live audience. Welcome to those who are watching us across our social media platform. It's my great honor to introduce this incredible panel. You're going to be hearing first from Beruz, and then we'll be doing a Q&A with our three wonderful panelists. Let me start by introducing them, and I am Carl So, the CEO of the ACLC, for those joining us online. Our first panelist. He kind of needs no introduction, but I want to give him a proper one. He is Beruz Bushani is an award-winning Kurdish Iranian writer, journalist, scholar, culture advocate, filmmaker, Renaissance man. His memoir, No Friend But the Mountains, won every single literary award in his country, deservedly, including the Premier's Literary Award. And that was written during seven years in detention, extraordinarily by text, smuggled out one by one by one. Well, it's just talking to Beruz before about the profound impact he has had in changing the national conversation. And so much credit goes to Beruz for being the person that goes, I'm going to speak out no matter what the cost or consequence is, and then suddenly creating a space that allowed other refugees to go, I can speak too. But what he also did was force his country to no longer look away by going, this is my story and I'm going to tell it no matter the consequences or the risk and that level of tenacity, ferocious courage uh, it's just something extraordinary. His new book, Freedom Only Freedom, was published in November 2022. Uh, Beruz was recently in Parliament House to call for a rule commission into, into immigration detention. He spent so much of his time also speaking up for the human rights of Kurdish people, Iranian women, human rights globally, um, between his lecturing, his filmmaking, his writing. He's one of the most extraordinary leaders. And I remember, Beruz, you were saying just in Parliament recently, they said I would never step foot in this country, and there he was in Parliament House calling for a royal commission. Can you join me in welcoming the Lucian Chaney? <laughs> Our second panel panelist, Bethlehem Tibubu, was born in Ethiopia, where she studied accounting at Haramaya University before seeking safety in Australia in 2013. Bethlehem was detained in Nauru and then in Bidu and Brisbane for over six years before gaining a freedom from detention in 2017. Sorry, a little bit shorter than that. She works for a Melbourne public transport company and shares her knowledge through public speaking. Bethlehem is fearless. I swear, one of the, is fearless, sorry, this, that the good. Is fearless in her public speaking, in her advocacy, in her courage, and continue to go out there and going, this is the impact on women. This was the impact of having our liberty and freedom taken from us in Nauru. And you have joined us on many trips to Canberra, leading the way in briefing senators and MPs, calling for genuine systemic change and end to offshore detention uh, and the humane treatment of refugees and permanent protection. Can you join me in welcoming that <laughs> Lennon? Our final panelist. Hadi Abdul Arur El Rauf. Sorry, Hadi, I just I can't put my name. Hadi Abdel El Rauf um, as is a long-standing leader of the ASUS. He's been working in many different roles for more than a decade since the organization first opened its doors. Um, she leads our incredible detention rights advocacy program, the longest standing and the only formal casework advocacy program in Australia that is focused on having daily contact with refugees held in offshore detentions doing incredible work around risk notifications, advocacy applications to get people evacuated, briefings that we give to centres and MPs to take on people's cases. Heidi's also a qualified social worker, um, and she's been supporting uh, the Mini Papua New Guinea for years. We are in daily contact. So when you hear the work that we're doing, it's because we are hearing it directly from men like Faisal. Can you join me in giving a, a Heidi a big round of applause? It is my pleasure to invite Beruz to come up first to share some words and thoughts about 
the emergency that is playing out in Papua New Guinea and what we need to be collectively demanding from the Australian government. Burroughs, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, Kong. Uh, very glad to be here. Uh, first, I should say about the book, the second book that you mentioned, Freedom, Rule, and Freedom. Uh, that book published uh, last year and not last year and um, uh, translated and edited by Omito Fikian and Mones Mansugi. Uh, just I won't mention that. I think it's important because, you know, I couldn't do all of these works without uh, people that have been working with them, people like Omi Dan Unis. Uh, actually, recently we launched a campaign in the, the uh, parliament, and that was really important because uh, some some of the refugees were there as well. Uh, so we talk about the royal commission. Why is important? Uh, and, uh, then in that day, I and, uh, Sister Jane and some other advocates, we met with some politicians. And the next day, I had a meeting with UNHCR. So, in all of these works, we were talking about, uh, those people who remain in Port Mosby. Uh, the last number that I have is 58 people. And so, They've been there for 10 years. Um, the, so far, 21 people have been transferred to New Zealand, uh, plus 10 families members, so 31 people. So that is a, a number that we have. And also uh, another 21 people are waiting to be transferred. And another three people uh, are waiting that their cases, UNICEF actually finalize their cases. Three people are waiting to be transferred to uh, America and 10 to Canada. So, but 10 people of these 60 people, 58 people are extremely sick and they cannot really engage with any process because, you know, they've been through many process for many years. First, they've been through the process with uh, PNG, which, so the case, it takes like three steps. So first they do the case, uh, the, they do interview with them, then they go to the second one, then third one. And later they've been through the America process, and that is a long process again. And so people are really hired and sick, especially those 10 people. So in camera, we've been uh, uh, having, we've had some meeting with some politicians, and some of them were from Labour Party, and then with the UNHCR, that uh, they transfer people to Australia especially those uh, 10 people who are extremely sick. And some of these guys, I remember four years ago during the Medimac uh, law on that time, I and some other refugees like Ben and Sata, we were working with the uh, refugees that uh, to work with the doctors uh, because they had to sign some letters when they transferred them to Australia. Some of these guys, even on that time, couldn't sign a letter. So they cannot engage with any process. And Australia officially said that we are not responsible, but actually that's how that works. I mean, people came to Australia, seek asylum in Australia, and you cannot just let them be behind. So the situation in Port Mosby, the, I think is getting more difficult because we are quite disconnected as well. Before there were more people, they would uh, talk about the situation, they would be, uh, they were in touch with advocates in Australia, but now it's getting hard. 
So because most of people are unwell and they don't want to engage, they are so tired. So that is the thing, the situation in Port Mosby. So hopefully, I think we raise this issue today. And also what is really important, or really there is a system that the, some advocates created to support the men in Port Mosby, like uh, financially or just for basic thing. So I think that is really important if you want to support them or if you know some people who want to support, I think it's easy. They already there is a system uh, created by some advocates, so it's easy to have access to, you know, people like uh, Faiza, you know, it's so difficult for me to see him because, yeah, I know him for a long time and it's so difficult to see him still there. So for supporting people like Faisal, uh, already there is a system that's uh, like a mechanism. So if you want to support them, so that is the whole situation there. But uh, 10 years, it's, yeah, it's crazy. I cannot believe, but that is the reality. Yeah, thank you. Great. Okay, I'm going to kick off with the first question for Beiruz. Beiruz, how does the current situation we're seeing playing out in Papua New Guinea remind you of the 2017 crisis in Manus? You know, thinking about a cut off electricity, a cut off food, they're trying to starve all of you out. Can you see, are there parallels there? Does it remind you of that moment in time in some ways? Uh, yeah, I think, yeah, it is the same pattern. So in 2017, of course, we were uh, like 600 people in Magnus. And uh, on that time, of course, uh, we, we managed to stay in the camp for 23 days. And I think one of the main reasons that we managed that again was working with the advocates and people in Australia because uh, of course on that time it was a big news and I remember that it was really a historical image when people went to parliament in front of the parliament and they did protest but on that time uh, again we found a mechanism that people in Australia, they send money to some people in uh, Lorengo town, some local people and some people from the church there. And then we could manage to bring some food, a little bit food uh, at midnight on the boat but to local people. And we smuggle that food in and we manage it. Uh, so that's... Uh, it's the same pattern, but now, as I mentioned before, there is a difference because these people who left behind in Port Mosby, we are quite disconnected with them. It is, it's getting difficult to find out what is happening on the ground, and they just left them behind. But I think, I believe that still, I believe in people's power, to create change or show their support. And uh, I think, yeah, as I mentioned before, there is a mechanism for some advocates to support them. Thinking about yeah, yeah. That, thinking about this bill rules, what action should the Australian government be taking and what action do you want Australians to be taking regarding what's happening right now? Uh, I think, uh, so officially Australia say that it is not responsible, but of course Australia is responsible. This tragedy created by Australia. So for now, uh, I think the first step is just people support those people who left behind in any way they can. Uh, but uh, I think we should just keep push you, push the government, but unfortunately in this country, labor always has been defensive, has been passive in front of 
help uh, someone like Peter Dutton. So it's really, and it's very, they add, uh, they are very power. That is the problem. You have the power, you are the government, people elected you, and there are not many people in this country voted for labor just for refugees or refugees were like the, one of the main reasons that people voted to this government. But now you see after the high court, uh, Senator Nick McKinney said something interesting. He said that the parliament lost its mind. So they just, it's ridiculous the way they reacted to the high court decision. And I call it competition of cruelty between these two major parties. But we know that who is the winner in the end of this battle is uh, someone like Peter Dutton because uh, he is being able to dominate labor. He's been able to criminalize the narrative of refugees. He's been able to even manipulate the media. And I, you know, we, I really highly criticize media in this country, in this particular case, because as a media, you should be aware that when you want to write about refugees, you are writing about people who've been dehumanized for many years. So you should be careful with the language that you use. So in this particular case, with the high court decision recently, they highly criminalized refugee narrative. And that is really uh, make me angry and i know that you know that as well you know that they even the headline so that was a good opportunity for someone like peter Dutton. Uh, unfortunately he's being successful to uh create that language and you that language has been used by the media by labor party yeah Beruz, i i want to ask you Recently, you've been writing about how bipartisan this competition of cruelty is. You've been writing some recent articles again that both major parties, thinking back to the days of Tampa, uh, have been joined at the hips on this. Why has this issue, as a country that doesn't, not even the top 60 in the world, in the number of refugees we take based on our wealth, that is the cruelest, that spends the most locking people up, that takes the fewest? Why has this taken such hostage of our two political parties? And why do you think they've been so effective in being able to, on the suffering of refugees, just what you're seeing now, gain so much power and, and influence? Uh, you know, it's a long story. We should go back to even before Tampa. So always I say that we should follow this language that has created dehumanize refugees you know these words that we find them they use them a lot in the media by politicians and it's just normal these words were not normal people you know about people for example is a very normal word these days in australia people use them uh, like illegal refugees this word, I think, created around 1996, 1995, if we follow them. So, I mean, the problem in this country is that the language, the dehumanization process has started from the language first. So, when you dehumanize people refusing the language, then you actually create, uh, you get ready to create it such a tragedy and that tragedy people don't see it and one of the most <laughs> unbelievable mh is when they brought refugees to a park water which is a park prison inside the city in front of everyone and people couldn't see it actually most of people so the, this violence has been normalizing this country, but it's not normal. 
keeping children in detention is normal in this country, but it's not normal. It shouldn't be, uh, never be normal. So that is a problem in this country. We have a long history of dehumanization of refugees. And when you dehumanize people, it's easy to kill them, it's easy to torture them, it's easy to banish them. And even the banishment itself is a hugely deep uh, humiliation. I remember, I never forget that moment when they banished us to Port Mosby in the, in the airport in uh, Christmas Island. That moment I remember that they are banishing me. You know, that's banishment itself. Yeah, you, when you banish people, when you exile people, that is a deep humiliation. But it's normal in this country, it seems. Yeah. Can, can, I, can I ask you um, one last question? I want to go to Bethlehem and then I want to come back and get your thoughts on the Royal Commission about the violence of language. You know, boat people, on water um, operational activities, stop the boats. Uh, well, two weeks ago, the Western Australian major newspaper, Detention monsters being released. Uh, we have to stop this at sea. Uh, illegal. I think, as a writer and as a journalist, uh, with such a, a passion and and focus on this, how critical has been the way in which language, law, and media with politics have come together to be able to sanitize this violence in a way that, like you said, none of this is normal. But as a country, we have become so complacent and comfortable with this cruelty. So can you talk a little bit more about the power of language to reshape morality and, and social conscience around these issues? Yeah, I think the, that, that is the main point, actually, the language. You know, always you should look at the language, the way they use it. And the main, uh, the, one of the, what's, uh, the word that they use for Manus and Naro, it's very crazy. They call it offshore processing center. Like this, that word it shouldn't be normal. You cannot park prison, park hotel, you know. And it's quite interesting. The other day, uh, I had a chance to go around uh, Melbourne and in Melbourne Bay. I don't know the name of the place. I think that place that the Prime Minister, former Australian Prime Minister, died in the water. Uh, yeah, yeah, in, yeah, yeah, yeah. So there, we found a hospital that was established on 1850. And by, just by chance, by accident, we visited that place. And I realized that, so they call it a, a quarantine, a hospital. But when you look at the history of that hospital, you see that it is just a prison, but they call it hospital. And it was quite interesting. I found out, I discovered that in 1999, they put 400 refugees from Kosovo in that hospital for four months. You know, I mean, it is a pattern. It's a pattern of violence in this country. But they just repeat itself and people don't see. Do you think so? Do you think it's also linked to our, our history of genocide? You know, the fact, we, yeah, yeah. The fact we haven't ever grappled with, yeah. I saw the referendum, we won't yeah. face our part. Yeah, definitely. That is the, uh, always I talk about it, colonialism mentality. You know, this colonialism mentality always repeat like a pattern of violence in this country, and we don't see that. Like that hospital is normal, people don't see it, but that, that, that is a place that people be tortured, you know? So in terms of the language that always I talk about it, what we should do in front of this language, we should create our own language, a language that represents us. So in some way we should decolonize the language. 
So that's we should do as a like an an activist writer and artist. You know, people who are really want to do something, create ch- change. We should uh, decolonize that language. I think that and sometimes this language is not actually only words. The way we create a space or refugees to empower them. For example, in that. Uh, uh, launching of the campaign for royal commission that was important actually doesn't matter or it's matter but it's not the the what is really important in that launching that campaign is that refugees were there and they talk they had their own agency so that is a persona Performance itself is important to challenge that narrative about refugees. And that happened in the parliament, you know. They stand up and they show their agency and they say, we are chasing you. So we are here and we are chasing you. That is really important. Sometimes this language, we challenge it through performance not only words and that happened in farming for example you know yeah because you're actually disrupting the binary of victim and oppressor and actually going i'm a survivor i'm resisting and i've got agency and the right to assert my human right yeah exactly so that's uh i think it's really important you know that refugees are banished to Manus and Naru, or they hide them in the prison camps for years to keep them out of sight and mind. But now they are in the parliament. They are uh, actually visible. I think that visibility is really important. That we are here and we are, yeah, we have, yeah, agency. Thank you. I'm going to stick. I'm going to come back to you for your thoughts on, on why we need a Royal Commission. It's my pleasure now to, to have Bethlehem speak. Bethlehem, from 2013 to 2017, first in Nauru, then locked up in, in Baidu in Brisbane. That's a profound period of time to lose your liberty and your freedom. Can you talk about what the impact of being warehoused, imprisoned offshore, had on you? and in particular, as a woman, what that impact was for, for you? Uh, thank you, Con, and thank you very much. Um, and it, that's the good language you use. Like, it's better to say prison. I think it's worse than prison, too. Yeah, because in prison, you know the exact date you're going to release. But when you are onshore or offshore, you don't know the exact, or the exact day you're going to get your freedom or your right. So the experience I have in narrow offshore or the community, I was in 10 for 10 months and in Nauru. Uh, I was the only Ethiopian. The first six months when I was in Nauru, I don't know where I might to be honest. <laughs> yeah, I just follow the refugees when they go to mess. I just follow them when they go to shopping. I just follow them because I was the only one who speak Amharic Ethiopian language, I was not English at all. Really. So I didn't understand the law and the procedure. After six months, I just found out what's going on, why I'm on a pen. Because I didn't have interpreter too who speak my language. Luckily, I speak a little bit Somali. There was a Somali interpreter. Sometimes I could understand. So what happened... I got my refugee status in 2015. After 15 months, I got yes. I went to the community of Naro. I used to work on Naro government as accountant for two months, three months. I tried my best to survive that island. I tried my best as much as I can because I don't want to be ended up in disaster because I came here to be said, find my dream as a woman, as African woman, to be independent. 
I don't want to be ended up like my mom. She's housemate. She can't study or she can't do. But here I say it's a Western country. I can study or I can do something to this world. But as a young age, I just ended up in disaster because I used to play basketball as a narrow team too. I was an accountant. I used to get paid high. But it was not safe. Especially for single women doesn't have any family or anyone even speak her language. It was not safe to go to the office or come back. They used to see me like a weird eyes because they said, oh, how terrific you work on a government? How should you be an accountant? But I say, oh, I have to do this. I have to work. I have to save myself. I have to help my family. I have, but I couldn't. I couldn't survive because I was the unlucky woman on that island. I say myself, I was unlucky woman. I got sick, I got attacked, and then I came to Nauru, uh, Brisbane Station for medical treatment. But that was the worst one. The reason, because I was affected in Nauru. I was sick. I was attacked. I came to Brisbane detention. I was not allowed to talk to anyone. I was in high watch for one year. And I was expecting something. Am I going to get better? Am I going to give me treatment? Because I was hiding for a while. Because it's the worst. Because on that Brisbane detention, because I already my mind was killed. Put me in detention for two years again. Oh, I just gone, finish. Lucky was the reason I survived on that detention. Is I have a face, thanks God, I believe in God, but I have the good people in the community, the Australian people. Because the policy in onshore and the onshore, the Australian policy tried to cook me like a barbecue. Oh, this side is not cooked. Let's do the other side. All my, my meat was burned. And then they tried to do my bone. Oh, the, oh, the hair bone is left again. But the community, the population, the Australian people, they used to come to visit me. Thank you, Sister Bridget. She used to come and visit me. The community, the population put me water because I was burned. I couldn't, I never ever dream I would be survived. Oh, all my body scratch. I used to try to suicide. I still have the scars. It will stay forever. That's the experience I got because I, I was trying to best. I was trying to get a work. I was trying to study. But finally, I survived. Thank you for everyone. Because of you, I would never survive because I was dead. I was killed. My mom was killed at all. I didn't get the treatment. I didn't get the safety, even though I was acknowledged as a refugee. I was acknowledged even when I was in Africa or in UN. But still, I was camped. That's the experience I have offshore, onshore, even in community detention. When I was released after four months, I got told to get out from this house. And I said, where am I going to go? I don't have family. I don't have a sampling. I don't know. I don't have any certificate to work. I don't know even how to use the public transport. Now I work on public transport, thank you, Scott. <laughs> I don't, I never see train in Africa. I never see bus. I never, tra I never see, I just came from rural area. But that time, thank you to Sister Bridget again. She gave us house for a woman. A woman come from offshore. She support us. And then I moved to here. I came to straight to SRC because they came to Brisbane. They gave me training for six months to be advocate because I was shy. I couldn't speak English, especially when my roommate, she came burn. Hold on. We used to be one room. They took her in the middle of the night and then she got burned in Nauru. And then when I seen the news, I was exhausted. I say, why didn't save her? Why shouldn't speak? Why didn't call a lawyer? Why shouldn't call Sister Bridget to SRC to save her when they took her? Because I was sick. I couldn't even have any power to walk to the mess. And then I say, finally, I have to speak up. When am I going to get 
any chance who's going to train me how to speak. They came to Brisbane every month, SRC, and they, they used to train us how to speak on the public. Lucky because I got that certificate. Now I announce on the public transport informations. <laughs> I wouldn't even know what to speak because mentally I was sick. I just cry every day, cry. So the system kill us, but the population, the organization, when we are hungry, we used to come here because we didn't have any income. When we used to find a job, we come to here. Con, we need a job. Sister Bridget, I need a house. I'm cold. It's winter. Can I get a clothes? Winter clothes. But the system, the Australian government, they kill me. I'm dead at old. But finally, I'm survived. I can smile today because I'm surrounded with beautiful, hard people. Thanks, God. It looks like the planet. I, I think the biggest credit comes to your own courage and resilience, Bethlehem. I'm interested with, with talking to Beirut about the need to decolonize, that how much of what is happening at the heart of it is actually about race. And I'm interested in you talking about your experiences as you know, that one, that one woman from your culture being there. Can you talk to me about as a woman of color, how much in terms of those experiences do you think Race, racism, played a part in what you went through because that system is built to torture you. Everything you went through is not, oh, that's an accident. That's the purpose of it. Just like they did to you, is to try to break you. What are your thoughts and reflections on that as a woman of color around your experience around how much of a role do you think race, racism, think about with experience of a hold on? Gender, in terms of your mistreatment and, and the abuse that you experience. Well, uh, uh, in my experience in Africa, women doesn't have equal with men. But I thought here would be better. I'd say they are they are educated. They don't do, they don't abuse women. They might give a chance to work. They might give a chance to study. But it's, things are different because. I was the only one that I don't cover my hair from African women in Nauru. Even the community see me like a different way. Oh, this is Africa, what she's doing? Oh. And then I say, even we don't speak a language, why they didn't give us somewhere no, or send us interpreter? Why they didn't treat us? Because as a woman, one have been in Africa, my father didn't give me freedom. Or the government didn't give me freedom. But here, I was expecting more. Especially for women, single women, I was expecting more for the young one, especially. But it affected us a lot. They didn't even treat us well. Even though they know the truth what happened to us, everything is hiding. We are the witness of offshore and onshore detention. But what would he expect from the policy or the government was completely worse than after. Because I'm 10 years here, I came in 2013, still, still I'm on a limbo. They didn't treat us as a woman. They didn't respect us as a color or a religion or a culture because I was the Orthodox in Nauru. I asked them a Bible. They say to me, we don't have Amharic Bible. I say, I can't read English. I mean, I won't understand. At least I can read the Bible and uh, I feel better. They didn't have it for two years. Even in Brisbane meditation, they didn't have it. Because Iranian, they get in Iranian language. The Somalian, they get in Somali. But me, I said, color, I said, different. I was treated like a bird. Because we need, we had the motivation, we have the power, we have the mind to study. We need to be a nurse. I want to be a train driver. I got the opportunity, but I didn't get it because of the policy. The government didn't treat me well or they didn't give me the chance or the proper visa. So completely 10 years is it's better to kill someone. For me, it's better to kill because still we are in big jail. We can't walk. We can't talk. We can't work. We cannot study. We cannot travel. We cannot see our family. 
we don't know what they look like because we are a woman. We need more. We need more from them. So it's completely different. Thank you, Petra. Thank, Thank you. Maybe we can swap. Yeah, yep, let's swap it. Heidi, you're at the cold face every day with your team talking to the men that remain trapped and imprisoned in Papua New Guinea. Yeah. And if you hear the government saying they're not locked up, well, they're locked up because they can't go anywhere. What are you hearing from the men on the ground? And what's the team hearing here at the ASRC? So there is a worsening humanitarian crisis happening. Um, the men are sending us photos of empty fridges. They're saying that they have no food. They haven't eaten for days. Their children are going hungry. They are saying that they are without power for lights and aircon in hot and humid weather. They are saying that they are feeling unwell, but they cannot afford to pay for health care or access by medications, and there's no safe transport to the hospital. They're asking us um, what will happen if we are evicted and we end up on the streets of Port Moresby. Who's going to help us? They are saying that they are isolating in their rooms 24-7 because they are too fearful to go out due to the risk of violent attacks in Port Moresby. Um, the men are increasingly distressed and hopeless and despondent. And um, they are facing into a new year of more uncertainty. And 2024 just symbolises the 11th year of being held in offshore detention and the continuation of systematic torture. Heidi, what is the physical and mental health state of the men? I've been reached out to a little bit before. Yeah. What are you hearing from the men? What are the health issues they're reporting? What are the mental health issues they're presenting with? Yeah. So we know that um, 10 or more are um, acutely unwell with, um, you know, severe physical and mental health issues, um, but many more are also unwell. Um, in terms of the men who are acutely unwell, um, they're suffering from things like uh, heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, uh, liver issues. Um, uh, many more men have chronic pain conditions and poor nutrition. Um, some require um, urgent, life-saving surgeries. Um, the men are suffering from severe anxiety and depression and PTSD and psychosis, and they are um, self-harming. Um, and some um, are suicidal, and the risk of suicide remains chronically high and unpredictable. Um, the the irony of this is that um, many of these men actually applied for Medivac during the Medivac 2019 legislation. Um, however, the law was repealed before they could be transferred and their health has deteriorated um, and, you know, the situation is quite dire. We know that 14 people have died as a direct result of the harmful conditions of offshore detention um, and coronal inquests have shown that, um, you know, significant and unacceptable delays um, in transferring people and having access to appropriate medical care has meant that very treatable conditions um, uh, mean that people deteriorate to a point where they, um, their lives are at risk. What are the consequences going to be if the men don't get access to the medical, mental health, accommodation, and food that they're requiring? What do you think will happen? If people become, if people are homeless, um, you know, they are at risk of, of, of violence. Um, if they're unable to get medical care or access medications, um, they are at risk of death. Um, if they are unable to access money and, and food, they're at risk of starvation. Um, you know, if children can't um, have access to nappies, they are at risk of illness. Um, it's, it's actually a really dire situation. 
my last question for you, and I've got one last question for Guru's and Bethlehem, is what's the one practical action our, our audience can take? I know you've been campaigning with, with Augie and the whole advocacy team. What can our audience do after today? So um, you should have leaflets on, on your chairs, um, which um, will give you instructions about how to take social action. So basically get in contact with your local MPs um, and, and senators um, and demand that the Australian government um, must fulfil its duty of care and take responsibility for the people it abdicated responsibility for in 2021 um, and medically evacuate them to Australia for urgent treatment. Um, resettlement is happening far too slowly um, and people cannot wait to be resettled. People need to be medically evacuated to Australia where they can access treatment um, and be prioritised for resettlement. Um, in the meantime, we can also distribute information to you about um, how you can support fundraising efforts which are going towards um, providing um, a small amount of, of money and food vouchers to the men in PNG to help them survive. I have one last question. Beru's first, and then I'd love your thoughts on Bethlehem. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you were in Canberra talking about the importance of a raw commission. We've done that before with the one in robo debt, Indigenous deaths in custody. Why, Beru's and Bethlehem, why do you think a raw commission into what has happened in our immigration detention centres is important? And what do you think the difference it can make? Yeah, thank you very much. I think. So for Royal Commission, you know, we refugees or people who have been working with refugees, we know a lot about the history of this tragedy. And I don't think, I think people of Australia, they cheered, even the most ignorant people, they cheered about Manus and Noru. So this system already, already exposed in many ways. But still, we don't know a lot, you know. We don't know, uh, especially for those people who've been killed under the system. I think the families should know what's really happened to them. Uh, also, I think is like people of Australia should know about the truth. And, uh, you know, because we didn't have a really a proper uh, independent investigation about those the people who be killed under that system. And I think that's really important that we know. And I think with Royal Commission, what is really important is that people feel, I mean, the refugees, that they are here, that the... Royal Commission as a like a official institution listen to them. That is really important because they've been denied refugees. They ignored refugees for many years and they didn't listen. So if that happened, the investigation happened, of course they will talk with many refugees. So that's really and also the Royal Commission it involved that means an official recognition of, of this tragedy. Official recognition or acknowledgement. That's important. But alongside human rights, which is really important, is above everything. I think the Royal Commission can find out about the level of corruption in this system. The contracts, the money they spend, and the security companies, a company like IHMS, company like Serco, all of these companies who uh, benefited of this system. So, according to Guardian, and they spend uh, fourteen billion dollars on this. It's a huge money. So. I think people of Australia will be in shock if they do this investigation and find out about the level of corruption. So that is 
uh, I think is really important. Always I say that might the violation of human rights doesn't shake Australia, that is our experience, but this kind of thing at least will shake Australia because I believe that many people in this country, they care about money more than human rights. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. It ran. Thank you again, Colin. Yeah, as uh, Barry say, especially the corruption, that's the more important. And the other thing, most Australian people didn't know about us at all. If we just walk, we walk, we smile, but what we lost was a lot. Time, health, motivation, our brain, it's a lot, our tears, our tears, our blood on attention, our life have to be this the case. We need the truth. Nearly 10 years, we need the truth to come out. Yeah, they need to investigate every single thing, everyone, every single person. What's, what's the life look like in detention? And we get a proper treatment. Are we get a proper, get a shower or food or the, the way we get treated? It was unfair. It was a lot of things unfair. Thing, things happened in detention that still there was unheard voices a lot. There was unheard voices a lot. So we need the truth. We need our right. Because I need my right. Everyone needs his right. Our equality. Our freedom to. We need what we deserve, especially refugees come from offshore. Are we deserve this? Are we deserve this today where we are? I don't know. So we need treatment. So I wish the Royal Commission give us our right or just find out the truth, investigate. Because all things are documented. We have to all document. They don't have to go far. They can't come to me. Have the whole thing in my document every single day of my life. Because I got, it was thousand papers every single day, every time they used to write the circle HMS. I got my, all my documents. So they have to find out at least the truth. We want the truth to come out. And we need a help from the Royal Commission always, because we need a help. That's why we went there. That's... Uh, yes. Thank you, Cole. Thank you.